Good morning. Hate to break up all the good catching up that everyone's involved in, but it's uh, almost a minute past the top of the hour, and I do have several announcements this morning before we get started with our worship service. As usual, um, I will not go through everything that's on the bulletin, so please grab one out in the foyer uh, to get caught up on on all the announcements and, and upcoming events. Um, first of all, as I look out in the crowd this morning, I really don't think I see any visitors, but uh, if I've overlooked someone, uh, I apologize for that. We do hope and pray that uh, you feel welcome this morning uh, and that you, uh, you feel as though you are uh, our honored guest because that's truly the way that we feel uh, about you. Um, in way in uh, in, in lieu or announcements that I do have, those that are in the bulletin, um, Autumn would like to have a meeting down front after service this morning regarding uh, SYC and the food that will be provided. Uh, for that, so anyone that's involved in that, please meet with Autumn down front after service. Um, Southside Church of Christ in Ozark is hosting a youth night tonight, starting at 5. If you are planning on going to that, uh, they had asked that you uh, RSVP um, on the Facebook page. VBS teachers, please have your, uh, your material orders to Derek uh, today. He's asked for that today. Um, Rick Holliday's mother-in-law, Donna Kittle, um, he gave us an update Wednesday evening that she was doing better. And, uh, and then Rick, I believe, is down in, in Branson this weekend uh, with work. Uh, so please remember him as he's away from home um, and continue to remember his mother-in-law. Scott Bailey's sister-in-law, Sharon, that we had mentioned for the past few weeks had had a stroke. Uh, she has passed away, so please remember that family in your prayers. Autumn, let me know that Parker's still not feeling well, so please continue to remember him. And then we were told this morning that Kevin Smith, um, preacher at uh, the Lincoln Congregation, his mother uh, passed away recently. He's uh, related to the Baileys, or at least to Scott. I don't know if that's through marriage, uh, so please uh, remember that family. Upcoming events, uh, the Spring Family Retreat is coming up this week, and um, then tomorrow night, the uh, bi-weekly Bible study at uh, Bradley and Whitley's house starting at 7. I believe they're going to be in Hebrews chapter 3 this week. And then I wanted to mention uh, Singing Emphasis is coming up this Wednesday. Um, that, of course, is uh, in preparation for um, our song fest is scheduled for August. We're continuing to learn new songs and, and try to refine uh, some of the songs that we've been practicing and, and getting ready for that. Also, um, May 18th, after Wednesday night service, we'll be having a celebration for uh, our graduate. I think we only have one this year, unless Beth's going to be able to be with us. Um, but that's May 18th for, uh, for Jensen and and hopefully Beth, if she can come. Uh, the only other announcement that I have uh, is my continuing plea for teachers that I will continue to plea for until I get those, all those openings uh, filled. Uh, again, uh, please consider and, uh, and pray about uh, that, that need that we have. Last thing I'll do is, is, is we do have a, a note, a card here uh, from Don and Barbara uh, regarding um, a Bambi and, and the ways that, uh, well, I'll just read. Dear church family, words cannot be found to express our gratitude for the many ways you have reached out to the Johnson family and our heartbreak as we have lost Bambi. We love you all and appreciate each one of you whether you made a phone call, came by, sent food, or most important, uttered a prayer for Tim and Zane. Thank you so much for the meal after the service, and thank you, Derek, for the wonderful reading and lesson that followed. Everyone who helped, thank you. 
Don and Barbara, and I'll put this up on the bulletin board. I'll turn things over to Chad. After this song, we'll have our opening prayer. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the If you would, uh, bow your heads uh, and pray with me. <clears throat> our most gracious Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this morning, Father, uh, so grateful uh, to be in your presence and be with uh, this fold, Father, and this congregation and the brotherhood here. Father, we're so thankful for the love that's present in this room, Father, for the commitment that each and each one of us have for, for you, Father, and for each other. We're grateful for the, uh, the comfort in that, and the joy that that brings us. And Father, if we don't recognize that, Father, we pray that you would help us to recognize that, that you would help us to uh, want to draw nearer to one another. In this life, Father, so that we could uh, enjoy it that much more uh, in eternity with you. <clears throat> Father, we ask this morning uh, several things, Father, that you would bless, uh, especially uh, our evangelistic efforts, Father, such as SYC that's coming up and approaching, that you would bless all the efforts that are put forth in that event. Uh, Everything from the uh, organization of it, Father, and the, the execution of it to, to those that will attend, that, that they will uh, be able to be with us and, and that everyone involved, Father, would be um, affected by uh, your words in which we study. Father, we're excited and ask a blessing for our upcoming family retreat uh, as an opportunity, Father, that you've bestowed upon us and as a congregation to be able to have the means to, to get together uh, aside from this, this uh, building or aside from <clears throat> our regular times of worship, we pray a, a, a blessing upon that, that we would all draw near together, grow close together, um, 
encourage one another and, and support one another, uh, learn more about one another, Father, that we could um, be a more be more of uh, in that we could be in each other's lives, Father, uh, more than we are. That we could fill each other up with encouragement and, and love and support, uh, so that we continue. Uh, to face this world that we're in. So please uh, bless this event, Father. Father, we're mindful of those that are not with us this morning. Father, many may be uh, have physical ailments that are keeping them from here, and, and uh, we would pray that you would uh, be with them and, and meet their needs as you see fit, whether it be medically, Father, or just uh, at your healing hands on them, Father, and, and, and bring them back to their, or restore their health, or whatever you see fit. Father, but we're especially mindful of those that are spiritually ill, Father, that oftentimes we, we struggle knowing what to do for them and how to help them. Father, we pray that in those cases you would uh, open our eyes to opportunities and help us to not miss those opportunities. Father, that those individuals would, uh, would know the love of you, Father. Father, we're especially mindful this morning of <clears throat> Tim and, and Zane and the loss of Bambi, Father, and we're um, so terribly sorry uh, for them and for that family. And we would pray that, that you would comfort them as often only you can. Father, we pray that you would use this tragedy, though, Father, to, to um, bring about repentance. Father, that, that, uh, that we may, as a congregation, um, that they may uh, see through the love that we show them, Father, uh, the, the refuge they have here, Father, and it would bring them back to the fold. Father, we're so grateful for the opportunities you give us, the forbearance and the long-suffering that you show us. Father, this morning we pray that you would uh, know our gratitude, Father, that we'd show it in our worship and our praise to you, that you would be uplifted and glorified and, and be able to smile down upon us and be proud of us as your children. We're so thankful for your son, Jesus, Father, and we pray that we tell you and show you that every day in our actions and our words. And it's his precious name we pray. Amen. Jesus, let us come to know you. Face to face, touch us, hold us, use us, mold us, only let us live in you, Jesus. After this song, we'll have our scripture reading and Derek's lesson. 
Blessed be your name in a land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name. Blessed be your name on a road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still. If you would, please turn to Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. Revelation chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them. 
And they stood on their feet, and great fear fell on those who saw them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they ascended to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. In the earthquake, 7,000 people were killed, and the rest were afraid and gave glory to the God of heaven. I have a Sunday confession to make to you. I am addicted to online shopping. I don't know if any of you can relate to me in that. Every now and then we'll have, uh, the same day, we'll have a, a UPS truck, a FedEx truck, and also a package from USPS <laughs> to come into our driveway. Uh, we had a neighbor, a nosy neighbor, trying to make me feel badly the other day, and said, you ought to feel terrible that, that UPS guy making him pull all the way back down your driveway every day. And I have to remind, that is my economic responsibility. I am a job creator. Look at what I'm doing for the economy. Yeah, I, I'm an online shopper. I, I do that a lot. I know many of you are the same way. And I've learned through the years, you know, the one challenge in online shopping is you can't see the product in person. And that's what people say. And I try to explain, you don't need to see the product in person anymore. And I've learned if you will just go by customer reviews, you will not go wrong. I'm telling you, it works. So if you see a product that you think is going to be good and customers who have bought it and used it have rated it a perfect five out of five stars, you buy it like yesterday. You know it's going to be a good thing, and it's always that way. Now, you will see a product, and you think, that might be exactly what I'm looking for. And when you look at the customer reviews, you'll find four out of five stars. Now, for me, if I can get a little bit of a discount, if I'm sacrificing just a little bit of value, but if the value's there still, and for a little less of the price, I'll accept four out of five stars. I still usually want whatever that product is. However, I have learned that if it's three and a half stars, that's no bueno. You don't want that product. And it may still be okay, but the chances are you're probably not going to be satisfied with what you buy. It's not what you want. And we're not even going to talk about what goes below that. So. But three and a half, that's kind of my cutoff point. I don't want something that's three and a half stars. But you know the number three and a half in the Bible works in a very similar way. It's used in times of trial and it's a number that really you don't want. It's not a product that you're going to enjoy, but sometimes it's something through which you have to endure even though you don't want it to be that way. As we're counting to Christ in our series, this part two of our number three and a half, we're going to find today that this is a numeral, a mixed number, that is used during times of oppression. We had about half of our study uh, last week in Revelation and Daniel. I know you've heard this before, but I, I love to, to state it. It is so true. If you ever look at the contents of the two books, the book of Daniel is the book of Revelation concealed. And the book of Revelation is the book of Daniel revealed. It's the same thoughts in both. Uh, you have the beasts and you have the images and, and they represent the same kingdoms and the same kings. It's just looking at it from two different perspectives. Whenever Daniel's given this information, it's the first time during the pages of inspiration and he's told you need to seal up the vision because the time is not now. And then John is given the same information 600 years plus down the road and the message is open it up because it's happening right now. And whatever hasn't happened is right around the corner, and that's the message of the book of Revelation, and then prior, that's the message of the book of Daniel. Now, we had half of our study last week in these two books. We're going to have all of it today, because most of the three and a halfs in the Bible are contained in these two pieces of writing. And we're going to start in the Old Testament prophecy, and I'll tell you about the time frame that's involved in this in just a minute. Not the time of writing, but the fulfillment which will take place. So... Uh, read along with me, and, and our study today, I'm going to tell you, is going to be more cliff-noted in our passages because we have some expanse, and that'll help us not to spend too much time uh, simply in, in the preaching setting. So, Daniel chapter 7, verse 17. Daniel perceives great beasts. We'll deal more with the numbers at a later time. It actually has to do uh, with our numeral for the month of May, and I know technically we bled over one... <laughs> but we're back in April, but for our study in, in May, it's going to be the number four. We're not dealing with that 
right now. So many great numbers, Bible numbers with terrific meaning, both in Daniel as well as Revelation. Well, there are these beasts that Daniel perceives that arise out of the earth. And we're told this represents, they're not like actual animals that are going to start attacking people, but they are kings, and really a little more specifically kingdoms that come out of the earth. And obviously Daniel's like, man, this is bunker stuff. I'd like to know more about this. I want to know especially though the truth about this last one that I've seen because this beast is different from the other ones. He has nails of bronze and teeth of iron. He really stands out. He has horns on his head, ten in number. Not for now, but that's another study down the road. And he mentions then there's this other horn that protrudes from its head. And so it never uses the number, but it's actually an 11, so you have 10, and then you have another horn that comes out. And then we're told that this horn had eyes, and as well, it had pompous, that's a great word, isn't it? <laughs> pompous words that came out of its mouth. And so it's personified, it's obviously representing a person. It has a mouth, and it has eyes, and it talks uh, pompous, it's self-centered, it's egotistical, is the meaning there. And its appearance was greater than the fellows. Daniel says that same horn was making war against the saints, fighting and prevailing against the people of God. And then he's told the meaning of this, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom that's going to come upon the earth. It'll devour the whole earth, or it's going to be a world empire, in other words. It will trample it, it will break it in pieces, it will enslave people all around the globe. And the ten horns, he's told, are ten kings that are going to arise in this kingdom. And there's going to be another one, an eleventh horn or king that arises in this kingdom. He's going to be different from the first ones. And he's going to subdue the first three kingdoms symbolized by the beasts that you saw. Now, we're not going to get into depth on the other three. That's going to be for next month. But you can't hardly talk about the number three and a half without at least tiptoeing, maybe even dancing around the number four. So put your tap shoes on because we're going to have to dance around it just a little bit. But just in mentioning it. All right, so, so what's going on here? What is this kingdom and, and, and these ten rulers and then a, an eleventh ruler? Well, first about that eleventh ruler, we're given more info in verse 25. Again, we find the, the tremendous descriptor. He shall speak pompous words. That is an excellent term, I'm telling you. <laughs> pompous. But it doesn't mean great things, especially in this context. He's egocentrical, or he, he's, he's so selfish, and he shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He thinks he's God. He acts as God. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change the times and the law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand, we're told, for a time. Now, we learned this last week. That's one, or if you like algebra, that's X. One X, okay? And times, the earliest fulfillment of which is two. So one and two. And then half a time. And so you have one, two added to that. And then half of another, which gives you the mixed number, three and a half. Now, we need to discuss what's going on. Here. And that's what Daniel's at. What am I seeing? I want to know more. <laughs> well, it becomes more apparent in John's time when he sees the same things and God says, This is not so futuristic. It's happening right now. The fourth kingdom was the Roman Empire. And again, we're not going to talk about the other three this week. But the Roman Empire that comes along, that conquers the world, and that is a real oppressor of God's people, the saints. And there are ten early rulers to the Roman Empire, as you can see before you. But if you trace through history, the eleventh horn, or the eleventh ruler, was unique from the others. This guy's name is Domitian, and he reigned from A.D. 81 to 96. So it's right about the close of the first century A.D. And here's how he's different. He thought he was God in the flesh, and he told people that. Now, that's not entirely unique among the Roman emperors, including some of the early ones. However, what is unique about it is he changed Roman law to reflect that. And he made it illegal not to bow down before him when he demanded it to worship him. And he persecuted God's people because they were violating Roman law and not treating him as the deity that he demanded. 
And that's what's unique about this guy. As prophecy foretold 600 years prior, there will be a great world empire that's going to come onto the scene after the Grecian one. It's the Roman one. There will be ten rulers, but then there will be an eleventh one, and he's unique. He's going to blaspheme God himself because he thinks he's God. And he's going to persecute God's people. He's going to change the law to try to make them to worship him. They'll refuse and they'll suffer his wrath because they won't give in. Although we're going to find in Revelation there were some that gave in and chose their lives over their souls. Verse 26 continues. There's hope though, Daniel, for the people of God down the road. He says, the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it forever. Did a little historical search and I found it quite intriguing. I located this not in scripture, but just from the pages of human history. That Domitian's rule, again starting in AD 81, came to a close in AD 96. And here's the way his rule ended. There were some people who served around him who didn't like him. He, by the way, we even told from history, he was an authoritarian. It wasn't a very likable person. It was his way or the highway on, on everything. The Roman Senate didn't like him at all. He stripped so much of their power away. It became even more of a dictatorship than what it already was underneath his reign. So people conspired who served a, around him to take his life. It was a well thought out assassination that was successful, the attempt. He fought uh, he wasn't able to be successful in it, though. His life was taken. I found it quite interesting who it was that conspired to take his life. The historical record reads, court officials did such a thing. <laughs> you remember the prophecy made 600 years earlier? The court's going to sit down together, and they're going to change this. He's not going to continue to reign over God's people. His reign of terror that he brought on the Lord's people of three and a half years... I will say that could be figurative, or it might be quite literal, some of the other three and a halfs that we're finding in these prophecies. Even though he reigned for 16 years, it may be that the ending three and a half years is this terrible time of oppression against God's people. And you look at the persecution of the Christians throughout the Roman Empire, and toward the end of the first century, it's some of, if not the worst, that they faced in all of it. Just as the Bible foretold, that the court convened, court officials got together and said we're going to change the way things are done in Rome and that's exactly what they did the power of this man was stripped away and a little bit down the road the power of the whole empire was stripped away same pages of history record that in AD 476 the real Roman empire fell that's considered to be the end of the Roman empire although technically there is a, a good sized portion of it the eastern section the capital of which was found in Constantinople which continued for another 1,000 years and came to a close in 1453. So God's telling his people ahead of time there's going to be this awful span of persecution of three and a half, whether figurative or literal years makes sense, the number of trial in the Bible. And this 11th horn is going to be responsible for it, Domitian by name, but his reign comes to an end, the reign of the terrible Roman Empire comes to an end, and notice the contrast in the kingdom that will remain. Verse 27, then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness under the kingdoms of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people. What people? The saints of the most high. Christians are going to have a foothold in this kingdom. And unlike the others, the four prior, his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions are going to serve and obey him. I find it noteworthy that prior to the fall of the Roman Empire in A.D. 476, there's a gentleman, you've probably heard of him before, by the name of Constantine, who came onto the scene. He became emperor right about A.D. 300, I, I believe it was a year before that, if I'm not mistaken. And a little over a, a decade into his rule as emperor, something changed in his life. There was a messenger who came and shared with him the gospel of, of Christ. He had been a Roman pagan all of his life. He was brought up that way, and he was blown away when he finds out about Jesus. And he converts to Christianity. I, I wish I could tell you he became a New Testament Christian. I, I don't know if that's the case. But he became a Christian. He was converted to Christianity in A.D. 312. 
And the very next year, 313, he issued an important historical proclamation, the Edict of Milan, which was the first amendment to the United States Constitution before there was such a thing. For the first time, there was freedom of religion. And by the way, it's kind of interesting. He becomes a Christian, but he doesn't make everyone else become a Christian. It's not convert or die. It's you can practice freely your, your religion. Isn't it neat that America was established as this, this great Christian nation, but we don't force people to become Christians. You can freely practice your religion. We reflect the ideology of our God, freedom of choice. And that's the way he was in the Roman Empire. And so Christianity was not persecuted from that point forward for a good deal right before the Roman Empire fell. <laughs> the very group that was so antagonistic toward the Christians becomes so friendly toward Christianity before it expires. Now look at the irony in that. And then we look at the kingdom of Christ that's still in place, outlasted the Roman Empire and has explosively grown and all around the world it's still thriving and doing very well in fulfillment of the prophecy. Tough time on God's saints, three and a half years, but then forever. Look at the blessing and the benefit in contrast that's found in Jesus' kingdom. All right, that's the book of Daniel. Now what I want to do is to cross over and look at some of the fulfillment of this, which is right around the corner in the book of Revelation. Uh, just to be clear, we're going to be backing up slightly in chronology, though. We were talking about events toward the end of the first century, and we're going to be rewinding a little bit more than a decade in the fulfillment of what's about to take place in the book of Revelation. Chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. John says, I was given a reed that was like a measuring rod, kind of like a tape measure for us. And there was an angel who stood and said, rise and measure the temple and those who worship there. Obviously talking about the Jerusalem temple that I believe was still standing at this time. But he says, leave out the court and outside the temple because that's the area that's been given to the Gentiles. And they're going to tread the holy city, Jerusalem, underfoot for 42 months. Remember that number? If you want, feel free to. Punch into your calculator 42 in months and divide by the number of months in a year and what number do you get? You're probably going to get a decimal in your calculator, 3.5, which as a mixed number is 3 and 1 half. He says, my witnesses are going to prophesy 1,260 days. It's believed by most Bible scholars that in the prophetic years, a 360-day calendar is used. And if you're wondering, well, why would that be? It's 365. And if you're going to round it, why wouldn't you round it up as we do? You know, five or larger, you go up four or lower and you, and you go down. So why wouldn't you go up to 370? It might have to do with when apocalyptic literature began to be produced. Daniel, Zechariah, that's the time of Babylonian captivity. And when Daniel and his buddies are, are carried away, they're educated in all the ways of the Babylonians. Today we mainly use a 10-based number system to count things. We only have 10 numbers. It's 0 through 9, and then we start over once again. Most of the world does that. Back then, not everyone counted the same way. The Babylonians used what is called a sexagesimal system, which was a base 60. They had 60 numbers, 0 through 59. And once they would get above that, then they would start all the way back over 0 once they had carried a 1, just like we do in our base of 10 system. If you divide in your calculator 360 by 60, it's a perfect product of the number 60. And that could be the reasoning why. You round up 370 and you divide by 60, it, it doesn't work the same way. And that may be why it was rounded down and you have a 360-day prophetic calendar year. Here's what I want you to do in your calculator. Punch in 1260 and divide that by the number 60. I'm sorry, 360. Left off the hundreds, that's pretty important. So what's 1260 divided by 360? 3.5 perfectly or three and one half. That's not a coincidence. Uh, listen, prophecies of the Bible are so mathematically calculated, it's, it's the brilliance of the Lord. And what he's saying to John is, I want you to take a measuring rod, and I want you to, to size up the city and the temple 
and those who worship in it. What he's saying is this, John, you are a master skilled, and God's giving you the ability to be a tremendous tailor for him. You ever had to be measured for your clothes because you're doing something important? I know we come from the Ozarks, and for most of us, the only time we've ever been measured for anything is if a buddy invited us to be a part of a wedding. <laughs> you know, we're just not that important. But that's really neat how they do it. Man, they are. There's, you know, and, and then you get it. And it's like, I've never had anything that fits so great. Well, that's what a tailor does. Fits the clothes to the perfect size of the person. What John is doing with the people of God of, of the Old Testament and with the temple and with the city of Jerusalem, like a skilled tailor, he's measuring them not for clothes, but for judgment that fits them just the way it ought to be. And God says, my judgment's going to be poured out on them for 42 1260 days no matter how you slice it 3.5 or three and one half years the number of trial is about to be brought upon the holy people of the old testament but he says prior to that i'm going to send my two witnesses to prophesy against them in sackcloth to try to get them to reform their ways because of what's about to befall them who are these two witnesses and by, by the way you remember the number two what does that tell you in scripture Power number, two powerful testimonies is the meaning of that that God is bringing against his people. It's widely considered to be these are the Old and New Testaments, respectively. Both of which thoroughly tell of the demise of God's people in the New Testament, uh, Old Testament, but New Testament fulfillment and the destruction of Jerusalem. I, I don't, I'm not really convinced that's the case, and I'll tell you why. I think there's another real possibility here. Verses 7 through 10 go on to read, And when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Now, naturally, we would think, oh, that's Satan. No, he's the dragon and he's the serpent in Revelation. The beast, remember, the beasts are representatives of kingdoms, and this is going to be the Roman Empire in fulfillment. The Roman Empire is going to make war against the people of God, and they're going to make war against the holy city of the Old Testament. Overcome them, kill them. Their dead bodies are going to lie in the street of the great city where also our Lord was crucified. You see, we're talking about the city of Jerusalem. Then those from the nations are going to see their bodies. Guess how long? Three and one half. This time it's not years, though. It's days. It's a period of trial that God's people have to experience. Three and a half days. They're not going to allow their bodies to be put into the graves. Those who dwell on the earth are going to rejoice over them and say, yeah, we won. Because God's two prophets who tormented those who dwell on the earth are now dead. <laughs> we know what happened to God's people who were persecuted under Roman rule. Uh, we often talk about how they lost their lives in being beheaded, crucified, like Jesus, fed to lions. And these are all true. But this one we don't often bring out as much. And that's that they were also dipped in hot wax and they were lifted along the important cities of Rome, the streets, and they were lit on fire, and they became human candles, human torches to light the roadways of Rome at night. And the savage, bloodthirsty people looked on and, and enjoyed this, what was happening to the Christians and providing a societal benefit, too. The streets were lit up then also at night, not even allowing their corpses to be buried. Those who were brutally murdered would be tied to animals or chariots and dragged through the cities in shame. And people, yeah, look at what we're doing to these Christians. That'll teach them a lesson. Not allowing their bodies to be buried. The two witnesses receive this treatment, God says. I don't believe this is a reference to the Old and New Testaments, although it could figuratively be possible. I think he's talking about real people who are giving the testimonies that came from Scripture. They often were written in scripture, I think he's talking about an important class that announced God's doom that he was bringing on Jerusalem. They're often connected in the New Testament. Ephesians, twice you find it contextually in Revelation, chapter 18, verse 20. You find the apostles and the prophets who were simply parroting the Lord's message about what would come to Jerusalem linked together. I believe this is the treatment that the apostles and the prophets during this terrible span of, of three and a half received in persecution for their good work that they were doing for God. But the good news is this, once again, it's not going to last forever. It's three and a half, and there's an ending to the three and a half, the period of trial. Verses 11 through 13. After the three and a half days, 
the breath of life entered them. They stood on their feet, and great fear fell on all those who saw them. They ascended to heaven in a cloud. There was a great earthquake. 7,000 people, that's an important biblical number, which is actually a multiple. It's 10 cubed times the perfect number, 7. So 10 cubed times 7, that's significant too, but for a later time. And the rest were afraid, and they gave glory to the God of heaven. Now we know a lot of, of Revelation and Daniel is written in figurative terms. Not everything is figurative in it, but many of the things are, and I believe that's the case here. I don't think the apostles and prophets literally rise from the grave. But they think, as with Jesus, if we can kill the messengers, we kill the message, and then it's over. But then they see these signs starting to unfold, and specifically mention earthquakes, and they realize, uh-oh, the message is resurrected, <laughs> alive and well. What they said is true, and we see it now coming to pass. And it's not just the earthquakes, although it's brought out here. They're repeating what Jesus taught. He said there would be earthquakes, there would be wars and rumors of wars, there would be famines and diseases, and this isn't the fullness of the trial to be experienced. No, Jesus says these are just the beginning of the worst trial that humanity has ever seen. And they see the message resurrected, and they realize that killing Jesus, killing his apostles, and killing his prophets did not kill what God's about to bring on them, and they know they're in trouble. As we cross over into chapter 12, we find in verses 4 through 6 that there was a dragon who stood before a woman. Now, in the book of Revelation, the dragon is not the same as the beast. The beast is representative of a kingdom, the Roman Empire, and there are different ones, different kingdoms. But the dragon, or the serpent, we know him as chapter 12 very plainly says, that's the serpent of old, the fire-breathing one that consumes and, and destroys. He takes life. That's Satan himself. Satan stands before a woman and wants to devour a child as soon as it's born. But this male child ends up being born anyway and survives. And down the road, he's going to rule all nations. Now, what child do you think that's going to be? <laughs> that's Satan versus Christ in chapter 12. And isn't that cool? You have this, this immensely powerful mythological creature and, and a dragon and a little innocent, helpless baby. And yet he can't kill that baby no matter how hard he tries because of the power of God being within and behind him. Now, we know there was a woman named Mary who gave birth to Jesus. Just to be clear, I, I don't believe the woman in interpretation is limited to, as we're going to find in the passage, to Mary, although it represents the faithful of God, which would be inclusive of Mary who helped bring the Christ child into the world. People of faith. The woman, the people of God, fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God and she's going to stay there 1,260 days. Remember that math in your calculator? What's 1,260 divided by the prophetic number of calendar days in a year? Not 60, but 360. 1,260 divided by 360 is a perfect three and one half. Huh. That's interesting, huh? Verses 13 and 14. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, simply meaning he's lost his power, he no longer has the keys of death and of Hades, that child who grows up and, and is crucified takes the, the reins, the keys from him, we're told in chapter 1 of the book. Now Jesus is in control. He persecutes the woman who gave birth to the male child. And with him, it's difficult to tell the difference between the Jews and the Christians, just like it was in people on the earth early on. Uh, you know, Christianity is the fulfillment of Judaism. The Christians were meeting in the temple with the Jews. and It's hard to tell the difference in this transitionary period. It's hard for Satan to tell the difference too. All he knows is there's these Jews who are responsible for bringing Jesus into the world. There are these Christians who are following him. Some Jews are becoming Christians. So he's just persecuting the whole group in this area. But the woman, the true faithful of God, she is given two wings. Two is what number in scripture? The number of power. She's given the power of flight and escape that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for guess how long? A time, one, and times, earliest fulfillment, two, and half a time, three and a half. God helps her out during the worst period of trial ever to come on the earth. The true people of faith from the presence of the serpent. Now this is really interesting to me. 
she goes into the wilderness to escape. She's given the wings of, of an eagle to do so. Eagles are known for their flight and how high they can go. If you want to find an eagle's nest, you go into a cave or dig a hole and hope to find one. Where do you find eagle's nests? High in the trees. They also really like cliffs and cracks that are found where, where people and animals can't get to. They'll put it very high in hills and it's stated to be in the wilderness. Do you remember what Jesus said in anticipation of the destruction of Jerusalem to the true people of faith, to his followers? When you see the abomination of desolation, the hated destroyers, the Roman army closing in, he told them, flee to the hills. That's where you'll be safe. And you look outside the city of Jerusalem. We sing a song, the hills, the, sound, uh, the mountains surround Jerusalem. It's found in the Judean wilderness. And of the million plus people who died in the destruction of, of Jerusalem through this three and a half year span and, and in the surrounding area, from history, you know how many Christians are recorded to have died in it? The destruction itself of Jerusalem? Zero. <laughs> because the worst period of trial to come on humanity, they listened to Jesus' instruction. They accepted the wings of God that he gave them of an, of an eagle, went to the wilderness, to the high reaches of the hills, and they were safe during that period of trial of three and a half. Now we're going to find the fulfillment of what we read earlier today in Daniel 7. Jerusalem's destroyed in the year A.D. 70. We're fast-forwarding about a decade from that point. Let's see if this sounds familiar to you. We're not going to read the early part of chapter 13 where there's, there's this beast that comes out of the sea and he's given a mouth speaking great things. That's the pompous, great word, the pompous words and blasphemies against the Most High. He's given authority for, guess how long? 42 months, three and one half years. He opened his mouth against God, against his tabernacle, representative of the church, God's people, those who dwell in heaven. It's granted to him to make war with the saints, to overcome them. Authority is given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation, and all who dwell on the earth, those who are worldly-minded and who don't serve the Lord, all who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life. That's the fulfillment of what we read in Daniel from the years A.D. 81 to 96, and perhaps a specific three and a half year period at the end of Domitian's rule that was especially oppressive over God's people. Chapter 14 brings some good news, though. Verse 8, another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen. <laughs> it's fallen. Print it in the newspapers. Sing it loudly. That great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now this is kind of weird, because all of a sudden, John backtracks and starts talking about a kingdom that's fallen 600 years ago. <laughs> what does he mean, Babylon has fallen? He's talking about, oh, Rome's terrible. It's, it's a mess. And all of a sudden, Babylon has fallen. Well, yeah, that's like more than half a millennium old, everybody knows that. This is one of those figurative references in the book of Revelation. Rome is not literally Babylon. Rome is metaphorically Babylon because of the connection between the two. Babylon was a people that took God's people into captivity and enslaved them, oppressed them, tried to make them bow down before idols to worship them. And for those who, who didn't, we know in the case of of Daniel, they were fed to lions, or at least an attempt was made for that to happen. We know in the cases of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were burned alive because they wouldn't give in to the king's edict of idolatry. Sometimes it's eerie how similar the pages of history are, even many centuries down the road. Another great world empire comes onto the scene, takes God's people as, as captives, begins oppressing them, tries to get them to bow down before and to serve idols. And they say, if you won't, we will, and they did. Feed them to lions, and we will burn you alive. They're Babylon, but 600 years later. You know, you can work against God, and you can hurt his people, and you might have power that he lets you enjoy for a time, but you're not going to keep it forever. Eventually, time catches up to you. Your period of three and a half is over, and you will answer to the Almighty of Heaven. That's what Babylon did, that's what Rome did, and that's what anyone does who gives in to these type of tyrants. 
these people had two choices they could make. Here's the first choice. Verses 9 through 11 of Revelation 14. He says, A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, you better listen, If anyone worships the beast, that's the Roman Empire, and in particular, Emperor Domitian at that time, if anyone says, well, I don't want to lose my life, I'll, I'll do what he says, and worships the emperor, and his image receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, just as the nation of Rome will, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment will ascend forever and ever, just like they saw in the destruction of their holy city. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. There were people who gave in and said, I can't take it anymore. The period of three and a half, the, the trial that's come on me is just too much. I, I've given up so much already, I can't lose my life too. And they exchanged their souls in the process. But John says there's another option and there's another group that's going to be around. Verses 12 and 13, he says, here's the patience. You might have perseverance in your translation. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the faith, no matter the cost, of Jesus and the commandments of God. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, right, blessed are the dead, those who actually end up giving their lives. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. There were some who said, we've experienced a three and a half and it was rough. Fast forward a decade. Here's another period of three and a half years and, and this is awful. But we don't care. We're going to hold on all the way firmly to the end. And as we close, I want to share just a few brief stories of those with you. The Apostle Peter himself was threatened with a, a terrible demise. You had better do things our way or we're going to crucify you. Peter said, oh, okay. Uh, do you mind whenever you, you crucify me just to flip me upside down because I don't feel like I deserve to go out the same way that my Lord did for me. Do you mind to do that for me? <laughs> you think he was afraid of death and what was on the other side? You have the Apostle Paul who we have recorded from history was beheaded in the city of Rome. And they really thought they were going to get him with this one. Oh, we'll have him quaking in his boots. Well, the first time he's imprisoned by the Romans and he thinks he, he might be giving his life, he writes to the Philippian church in the first chapter, and he says, guys, this is a tough choice for me because I really want to be beheaded right now and, and go ahead to my reward to be with Jesus. But then I think about you and what your needs are, and I think, well, I probably ought to try to stick around for a little bit longer to help these people out. Does it sound like he was afraid of what was on the other side? John sees all this scary stuff in the book of Revelation. He, he mentions kind of like Daniel, you know, he falls, the strength leads, leads him. It takes a touch of the Almighty so he can stand up and even keep going. He sees all these scary things and how the Lord's going to come and bring all this judgment. And at the end of the book, he says, Amen, which is let it be. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Come on, Lord Jesus. We have to wait around for this. Can we do it right now? Does it sound like he's afraid of what's going to be in the end? What confidence these people and like them possess. They didn't care. They didn't love their lives to the end. They loved their souls and they loved their Lord more than anything else. And they were going to push through their period of three and a half no matter what it cost them. I mentioned to you last week, I, I bet everybody in this room right now has some kind of three and a half going on in his or her life. Some kind of trial. And I bet every one of us, if we're honest, man to man, woman to woman, boy to boy, girl to girl, could say, I've thought about, is it really worth it? Can, can I push through that much more? And then you say, why am I going to snap out of it? Of course, it's all going to be worth it. But it does. The thought cross your mind. The dragon tempts you. The beast tries to force you to give in. Do you have the kind of confidence that these servants of the Lord had? And they said, I don't care what it costs me in this life. I will not allow my soul to be taken from me. I will not allow my relationship with the Lord to be impaired. There's a reason they had the confidence that they did. Revelation chapter 20 says it in verse 6, they were among those found to be blessed and holy because they had taken part in the first resurrection. And if you do that, the second death, which is being cast into hell, your body and your spirit combined, has no power over you. In translation, it's, it's this. If you've undergone the first 
resurrection. There's a second resurrection when all the bodies come out of the grave in the end, the final one. But the first resurrection is being united with Christ in baptism to live for him. And if you've come up from the watery grave and you're living a life for Jesus, the second death has no threat to you. If you've undergone the first resurrection, you will only die once. There is no second death in your future. But if you skip the first resurrection, you have two deaths that you must die. These people had been through the first resurrection and so they had no fear of the second death. Jesus encourages people in the early part of this letter going through tremendous persecution. He says in chapter 2 and, and verse 10, don't fear any of the things that this period of trial has to, to bring your way. But he says, be faithful until, even to the point of, if it costs you your life, and you won't lose, but you will gain everything in the end. I will give you the crown of life. You'll be victorious. I will make you kings and queens ruling with me in heaven is the message of Revelation. And then we look at Jesus and we say, well, that's easy for God in heaven to look down on us and all of our trials on earth and to say, that's easy to say for the one who's ruling as a victorious king right now. But do you realize through what Jesus went to get to that point? Before he wore the victory crown of a king, he quite literally made himself wear the crown of suffering first. He wore a crown of thorns on his head. Go figure, for a period of three and a half, he went through torture in his ministry on the earth, culminating with his crucifixion so that he could wear the victorious kingly crown. And now he advertises, I want to give you the crown of victory. I want to make you kings and queens of heaven to be able to rule with me. But you have to do it my way and understand that first there's a period of three and a half through which you have to go on this earth. There will be trials and sufferings. Just as I had to wear the crown of thorns first for you. If you're going through that period of three and a half in your life right now and you're trying to do it alone, you don't need me to tell you that's not working out very well. And you need some help. <laughs> you're not strong enough. You need the strength of the Almighty to help push you through. And if you're looking at having that kind of strength, and so you have the confidence, you know what awaits you on the other side. You have the opportunity to have Jesus within you and to shine through you and to strengthen you through all your trials to get to the other side of the three and a half so that you can have blessing untold with him, the crown of victory, and to get to be a king or a queen in heaven alongside him. And if you need that in your life, if you made the decision to do something about it today, come and count your way to Jesus while we stand and sing together. I wish I could walk through when you 
age-old tradition was taking place Jesus gathered around his apostles the tradition of the Passover we read about in Exodus Jesus implemented a new fellowship meal though this one last time for years the, the Jews have been celebrating this Passover feast a very important aspect in their religion it commemorated God's final plague on Egypt he had spared the Israelites, his people, if they would just take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the doorpost. There's many details in the Exodus chapter 12 that you can read about, but that was the main aspect. Take the blood of the lamb, sprinkle it on your doorpost, death will pass over. Again, for years, they celebrated this. This day was no different to celebrate the Passover meal to commemorate that time. But again, Jesus, he implemented a new fellowship meal, a new covenant. We can read about Jesus and what he said in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I want to read what has really pricked my heart out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And I know it's been read many, many times, the men up here serving in the Lord's Supper. But Paul says something that kind of strikes me pricks my heart like I said and you don't find it in the, the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and I want to share, the, share what, uh, what Paul writes here again chapter 11 and I'll back up and to reiterate Jesus' words that is recorded in Matthew 11 starting at verse 24 and when he had given thanks that is Jesus he broke it and said this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now moving forward in verse 27. 
Paul says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, excuse me, for he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number are asleep. I read that and I I question myself sometimes. Am I living a life of faith? Do I put all that I have in him? My faith? Do I do I show up here amongst my brothers and sisters and do I express faith? Am I an example? But more importantly, my relationship with Christ. I don't want to just warm a few. And this isn't to be taken that it's more important than reading the Bible, praying, singing worship songs to him. It's all integral. No one thing is more important than the other. But Paul is stating something here. And I take this as my whole worship. Examine yourself. What am I here to do? Not just in this worship building, but in life. What am I to do? What is my life supposed to reflect? At this moment in time in worship, I am to remember Christ and his suffering, what he did for me. It is a remembrance of his death, a celebration of his resurrection, an understanding that he will come again in the future, and to be thankful So at this time, I'm going to do a little something different. I'm going to ask that each and every one of us here examine themselves. And I'm going to ask for a few moments of silence before Tony leads us in prayer. And to reflect on that, to be thankful, to come to God. You might be battling something, confess to him your sin, your wrongdoings in life. Come to him confession, repentance, and have that relationship with with God before we partake of this. So let's bow our heads in silence. Our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come together as a group, as uh, brothers and sisters, to remember what your son has done for us and that he gave his life willingly and and, uh, without a second thought, Lord, for us. I pray that at this time that we partake of this bread, that we reflect our lives and, and understand that this is not just for the moment, but for each and every moment and all decisions that we make, that we look to him for answers. Help us to reflect on his suffering and his love that he gave us. And it's through his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
this time I'm going to ask Jim if he would lead us in prayer. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us as we continue this memorial feast, remembering your son and the ultimate sacrifice he made, laying his life for imperfect people and sinners like us so that we might have home in heaven. We ask, Lord, that you bless this cup representing his blood and uh, that we might examine ourselves and take it in a manner pleasing to you as we pray in your son's name. Amen. overlooked. That concludes the, the Lord's Supper. It's a separate act. We uh, find it convenient to set aside this time to be, uh, to be thankful for the things that we have been given in this life, what we've been blessed with, and to give back. And for the sole purpose of building the kingdom of God like to uh, read uh, again from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Paul writes, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. Verse 2, On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save as he may prosper, that no collection be made when I come. <clears throat> we read also in scripture that it's, a giving heart that uh, <clears throat> is to be given or to give back uh, to uh, further uh, the kingdom of God. Um, 
through hearts of giving, through a giving heart, I should say. Um, at this time, we'll, uh, we'll offer our thanks and prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we again come to you on bended knee, Father, so very thankful for the opportunities that you give us, not only to gather together, Father, to, to come together as your people, to fellowship, and to most especially worship you, Father, but to, at this time, to, to have the opportunity to give back. Father, you are the ruler of our lives. We, we pray for forgiveness in the times that we do fall short, Father, but, that, but at this time we, we offer thanks, and uh, we pray that the funds given from each and every one here, Father, that it be used in a meaningful way to build your kingdom, to glorify you only, Father. Uh, blessed be the hands that, um, that oversee it, Father, and uh, may, may the men who oversee these monies uh, always put you before everything, Father, and uh, put the money uh, to good use. Father, we're so very thankful for all the blessings that you bestow on us each and every day, the means to which we can provide uh, not only for our families, and do the wonderful things in life, but to give back. We're so very thankful for that, Father, and your Son, whom we pray through. Amen. And we'll have our closing prayer afterward. <coughs> Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in, oh, his love. Sun sets free, oh, is free in me. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child. Child of God.
Please pray with me. Almighty God and Father, what a wonderful opportunity to come together and assemble in this place to worship you and, and give you the praise that we, that we desire to do and that you're so worthy of. We're so thankful for this opportunity to gather as Christ's body at this location for us to encourage and edify and strengthen one another. And we're so thankful for the measure of health that's allowed us to do that. We're mindful of those who are ailing with various health issues and uh, they're on our prayer list and we ask your continued blessing on them. We ask, Father, that you be with us as we uh, begin this new week. We pray, Father, that uh, as we do so, we would wear the name of, of Christ in such a way that would bring honor to him in, in the things that we do and the things that we say. We do ask you to forgive us if we fail you in, in any way, and we pray it in Jesus' name.